you get enough coffee <laughs> and cake or apples. Now Claudio Jäger is uh, going to speak about OPSD as a routing platform. Um, yeah. Go on. <laughs> so, yeah, I will talk about using OpenBSD as a router. Um, I will cover more or less the from where we're coming and where we actually try to go in the next couple of releases. And I will f also focus mainly on what happened during the last year uh, in OpenBSD in this area. So past, from where are we coming? Um, a lot of people are using OpenBSD as firewall and uh, I think that's one of the, the key strengths of OpenBSD with uh, PF which is probably one of the best uh, firewalls available at the moment. Um, then we have AltQ which implements quality of, s where, where you can implement quality of service policies. Um, a other feature that we added a couple of years ago was CARP and together with PF Sync you actually can start doing uh, high reliability firewalls that fail over um, without even actually losing TCP connections. Um, then Trunk was added to um, bundle Ethernet links in FreeBSD. This is now the aggregate driver. It's called lag I think. Um, you can load balance, you can round drop in and you can even fail over the Ethernet links. So to get trunk together with CARP you actually can build up a system that uh, will always be reachable even if one switch is lost because you can use the trunk failover uh, and you add CARP on top of it and by doing that together, you, you get a really reliable system. Um, one other thing that a lot of people don't know that we can do that is the so-called MBOF tags. MBOF tags is something that is totally inside the kernel and not actually visible to the user land. MBOF tags are here that you actually can add metadata to your packets that flow through the network stack. This is mostly used by PF to actually tag packets incoming and then you actually can do specific matching on the outgoing rules and by doing that you can actually simplify your rule set normally quite drastically. Um, in the routing uh, area we started first with OpenBGPD uh, that was in 3.5 um, and it through the years now, we already have quite a lot of support for various uh, RFCs and uh, also some other stuff that's probably unique in, in OSPFD, uh, in BGPD. So, first, one of the most important things about BGPD is that it has actually a atomic configuration reload. So, everything is based on your configuration file and you reload the configuration file. This is a really different to the approach that most other uh, routing architectures are using by like Zebra, Quagga or Cisco. They normally have the CLI and you start editing or changing your configuration and while you add, while you hit enter, it's already starting to, to try making a connection or whatever with and um, that normally can cause quite troubles if you start reconfiguring your systems. Um, we have support for BGP communities. You can check, set and remove the, the communities. We have multi-protocol capabilities to support IPv6. We can do few BGP sp um, specific RFC like root reflection and root refresh. Um, Root reflection is here that you can simplify your IBGP mesh. That means you don't have to uh, implement an absolute full mesh in your network. This is normally handy when you have a lot of routers. Root refresh uh, is a concept that you can request the, n your neighbor to actually resend the whole routing table. But it's a little bit of a crappy RFC. Um, 
We have inbound outbound soft reconfiguration. That means when you reload your configuration, you no longer have to, and, and you have changed your filter configuration in BGP, you no longer have to clear the, uh, the, the neighbor sessions to catch up with the filter changes. It's doing it now while you actually reload the configuration. Um, Outbound soft reconfiguration does not need uh, additional memory, but inbound um, soft reconfiguration, because it actually needs to know what the host <coughs> sent me, and I have to keep this information around, needs more memory. Um, we're uh, using a, we could say, copy and write scheme there, so we normally, if you don't modify too much thing, we don't actually need m a lot more memory for uh, inbound software rec re uh, reconfiguration. Um, these are the OpenBGPD specials. This is stuff that we support in OpenBGPD that's normally not seen in other um, BGP daemons. We have a possibility to add prefixes to a PF table, even if the prefixes are actually uh, not valid for the uh, um, for the forwarding path, you can still add them to a table. Um, it's, we have so-called root label support. A uh, root label is a label that we attach to a root in the kernel. And PF can actually then uh, look at this label and do decision based on the label. This comes in handy if you want to do um, like quality of service, if you want to prefer certain links or if you just say okay I have my upstream provider that um, uh, is where I have to look that it's not pushing too much traffic out or I want to actually reduce the uh, the amount of traffic sent to him I can use these root labels. Um, we have support for CARP interfaces in BGPD so that uh, when we have uh, um, we, we can do BGPD failover with CARP. This is uh, probably handy if uh, people want to run it at like a uh, internet exchange point and they only get one IP address and but they actually want to have a redundant system. You have your two BGPD routers running, one is in backup, it's actually having no active sessions and the other, the master makes all connections and if the master disappears the backup will do will, will start to open up all connections and that normally works a lot faster than waiting for all timeouts and re renegotiation of the, the sessions. We support TCP MD5 and IPSec as security mechanisms. Um, they are directly integrated into configuration so you don't have to fiddle around with special IPSec configuration. And like TCP MD5, it's just a simple line in the configuration. You just give the key and it's just working. Uh, another really special thing is that we can have, we have some special macro. We could say it's the, the neighbor IAS value that you can add to, um, to communities. Uh, the idea behind this is that a lot of configurations normally try to add communities based on the neighbor that is act where it received the uh, like the prefix or where it is sending to and this makes it a lot easier because you can simplify your configuration as an example at the telehouse internet exchange in Zurich we switched from a zebra system to a open BGPD system on zebra we had to actually configure special route maps for every neighbor and this is normally the, the, the config ended up with a couple of thousand lines and we replaced it with OpenBGPD that does actually the same thing and it's 20 lines of configuration. So that's that's the thing that's pretty cool. Um, the other routing daemon we we have that is OpenOSPFD, that's an internal gateway protocol daemon. Um, we added basic protocol support and we added the we are able to redistribute static and connected networks. So 
that's not a lot of stuff that we support. And um, why is it? So in the last, yeah, it's now two and a half years that the, the, the OSPFD is in the tree. And in the first one and a half years, we mostly fought with the state machines and the various uh, interactions between all OSPF demons in the network. It's a, um, a pretty big mess because it's all multicast and everybody talks with everybody and you have to do the right decisions based on your view and in the end all machines need actually to have the same information and even small errors normally end up with like crazy instabilities in your network and um, yeah one of the, the big problems is that the uh, the RFC the described mirror was PFD is not very explicit written like they have some gray areas where you have to figure out what what you actually have to do and one other problem is that we have found a few systems that are actually violating the RFC so you have to add workarounds to get them working. In the end uh, OSPF is a lot harder to implement than BGP because BGP is using simple TCP session you, you talk to your neighbor you get his stuff um, you get all the, the prefixes and then you do a local calculation and you're done and if you're not getting the stuff right, it's okay, your routing table is probably not 100% correct, but it doesn't result in like a meltdown of your network. Whereas in OSPFD, every router uh, communicates through multicast messaging, flooding their information out to the network, and if you miss updates, or if you interpret them wrong, you actually get a total wrong view of the network and normally this can result in stuff like evil routing loops and that can bring down networks. What did we do in the, during the last year? Um, this is mostly from 40241. In the kernel we added in PF a new thing that's unicast reverse path forwarding checks. Um, the idea behind this is that you actually take the, uh, the source address of the packet that is incoming, you do a root lookup with it, and then you compare the outgoing interface of that root with the incoming interface where the packet came in. And if they do not match, then this check failed, and you can deny the packet based on that. So it's a little bit an anti-spoof on steroids. It's, it's, it's working normally very good for um, for routers with a default root or actually firewalls like the end firewalls on your border it normally does not really work well in the middle of your core network where routing can go various passes. Um, we added support for multipath routing actually it's equal cost multipath routing um, so it's possible to define multiple next hops to a specific network and the, uh, the system will then load balance the, uh, the connections. The algorithm we use is um, built so that we use the, uh, the source and destination address to build up a hash so that all connections from, the same, from one host to another host always take the same path unless you remove the path from the tree. Um, and the idea behind this is that to uh, solve the problems that you normally get with multipath routing in TCP because when you have different passes in TCP you normally get problems because packets are able to surpass others and that normally results in, uh, in window changes and uh, the, the receiver normally uh, closes down the window because it thinks that there is a network con get congestion and so you get pretty bad um, <coughs> speed when this happens. Um, another thing we added is the uh, carb demotion counter. 
the carb demotion counter is a concept to make it possible that the user land has like a feedback mechanism to the carb interface to tell the to make the carb interface to do a, a failover even if the system itself is still running so you can use the carb demotion counter to um, to like on boot up we 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 um, we raise the, the demotion counter and by doing that the, the system that's still in, 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 in the phase of booting up doesn't get master. This is used like in, uh, in SASYNC-D which is our IPsec failover daemon. Um, when that one boots up it raises the uh, demotion counter and then it does all the public key uh, calculation which can take a, f uh, a while and does exchanging the keys and everything and only when it's finished it will reduce the demotion counter and then the master system will normally take over again from the backup system. This is a bit of... Uh, it, it really helps and it can be used also with other demons. We have it now in, uh, in, in current, we have it in, in BGPD, we have it in OSPFD, we have it in SASYNC-D. Um, so multiple demons can tell uh, if the system is in good condition or not. Um, and that's, this stuff here is mostly from 4.1. So in 4.1 we added a support for multiple routing tables. It's still very preliminary, but the uh, basic idea is working. So you can have multiple tables in your kernel. You can add routes to these tables and you let them PF do the selection of which table it should use for a, a rule. So what it actually does, it's, it's, um, it lets you do policy routing on a uh, higher level than with the uh, root 2 statement that is already part of PF. It is, you can do a lot more with it, but it also comes not, with the cause that the setup is more complex than a simple route to uh, rule. We added the uh, rapid spanning tree protocol support in Bridge, and it's actually now the default. So, no longer 40 second wait times uh, with spanning tree. Uh, it's a lot better than uh, the old spanning tree protocol. But I'm still not really a fan of it, so I'm not... <laughs> um, then we added a third rooting daemon, or actually a, a, a rewritten one. We added uh, a RIP version 2 routing daemon. It is mostly intended to replace the really old route D, which is a, um, yeah, a evil piece of code. And, um, it's mostly based on OSPFD, so it's looking very similar, but it's a lot simpler than OSPFD because uh, RIPD is from the protocol, it's, it's pretty simple. And there are still uh, like small appliances that normally only can talk RIP and not OSPF or BGP, so you still need a uh, RIP-capable routing daemon in the system. Another thing that was added is host state D. There was already a talk about it, so I will keep it really short. It's a, uh, uh, a load balancing monitoring daemon um, for layer 3 and layer 7. And uh, I think it's a pretty cool application because you can do really crazy stuff with it. No? Okay. Um, this is the stuff that we changed in BGPD uh, during the last year. Um, as I said, we added the capability to <coughs> influence the carb demotion counter. So it's possible to um, flag your most important sessions with the carb demotion counter. And so when you're uh, losing really important sessions like your full feed, then you can signal your system to fail over to the backup that probably still has the feed. The other thing we added is a uh, max prefix timeout. Max maximum prefixes are normally used in uh, in um, on peering sessions where you just say, "Okay, we limit the, the number of prefixes to 10, to 50, to 100, to 2,000, depending on your uh, neighbor." 
And if they hit the limit, uh, until now it was so that the session was administratively taken down and somebody had to log in and clear the session again to bring it up again. Now we added a timeout which just takes the session down for some minutes and then tries to bring it up again in the hope that the other side realized in, in between that they made a fuck up and fixes their side and then the session comes up again. This is mostly a thing to uh, to make you sleep longer during night because normally stuff like this happens in the middle of the night and then suddenly somebody calls you could you not please clear your session so it's something for the operators. Two other things we added is the BGP LG and BGP LG SH uh, tools. One is a CGI um, written in C to uh, do looking glass operations directly with uh, OpenBGPD. It runs in our change rooted uh, HTTPD um, daemon, or it's using that, it's, it's able to run in there. Um, it's using the uh, restricted control socket from BGPD, so it only can read stuff, it's not able to change anything. So you can just do all the show commands, but everything that would actually change the state of BGPD is not allowed. The BGP LGSH is more or less the same application. It's just intended to be a, uh, a CLI that simulates the, uh, the way a Cisco works. And uh, it's mostly intended for remote looking glass application that then can telnet or SSH into your machine and getting that information out. In OSPF we finally started to add a couple of new things that um, because it's starting to get more and more stable. We added support for, uh, or actually we more or less rewrote the redistribution code so it's now possible to depend on uh, the redistribution to depend on routing labels. It's also possible to negate redistribution rules so you can say no redistribute 10 slash 8 so you don't redistribute that uh, internal network. <coughs> we added reload support which is um, I think one of the most important things that was missing a long time. Um, it's no longer necessary to restart your OSPF to change configurations. Um, it's now possible to run OSPF in on if you have multiple networks on the same interface, then it's now possible to run OSPF on all those networks. This is something that uh, only that, that was a speci specific feature that uh, Quagga and Zebra had. But e.g. a Cisco is not able to do that. So you cannot have uh, two OSPF running, uh, or actually having multiple networks on a Cisco and have running OSPF on all those uh, networks. The last part is it's now able, we're now able to um, define on the redistribution rules um, the uh, the metric and the type, so it's possible to define if it is a AS external type 1 or type 2 message and you can actually specify the, the metric. The idea behind this is that you can have uh, multiple router connected to a same network and you want to redistribute that <coughs> network but you want to define which one is the actual most, uh, the router with uh, which the traffic should actually flow through and which ones are just like backups. Um, what happened during 4.2, so one part, or the, actually in the kernel, one big uh, thing that happened was we uh, looked a little bit at the network stack and tried to improve performance and we found a few things that were just like slowing down the system quite massively. One of the most important ones uh, in PF performance was the uh, actual MBOF tags that I talked about earlier. Um, it is that the, 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 this P 
PF meta information that we attach to every packet was actually pretty expensive to do because every time a packet passes through PF it attaches this tag and the tag is allocated with malloc and malloc is not really fast so by changing that and actually moving this this information which is just about 12 bytes or something like this directly into the MBOF packet header we improve the performance by 100 percent which is quite massive um, then we started to skip stuff that is most systems not really active like IPsec it was so that IPsec even if nothing was configured it started to do root lookups all over the place and these are not really fast so we are skipping now these checks if there is no IPsec flow defined and by doing that we actually gain something like 5% uh, in, in PPS rate in PF we skip unnecessary checksumming um, we once added this thing to uh, because somebody found out that you can use these uh, checksumming you could figure out if it is a firewall or not because a firewall will just uh, drop your packet or actually will reply you to you with a reset if you send him a packet with a corrupted checksum whereas a end system will just re uh, drop the packet because the, uh, the, the checksum is wrong and um, we did this for every packet that came in and now we're just doing it before sending out the reset and by doing that we actually um, skip quite a lot of checksumming that's not necessary uh, one last thing we did is we actually profiled the kernel with a, a 10 gig card that we had a driver for it and uh, we tried to figure out what why the performance was so low that we got and um, while looking at the the the, uh, the cal graphs we figured out that we had two functions that took extremely amount of time one was the uh, the kernel random pool steering function that was using I think it was like 20 percent of CPU time and um, we figured out that we actually stirred this pool on every packet that was incoming even though the uh, the packets that came in all added the same randomness to the pool and in the end it would be enough to do it once for the per interrupt and we changed this now and that added quite a a boost again. The other thing is uh, our pool allocator did also a stupid thing. It actually accessed the timer on every free. So by accessing, accessing the clock, which is pretty slow on a couple of architectures, like on AMD 64 we had still the, uh, I think it's the old um, normal clock uh, driver it took so long to access the clock that we ended up with losing a lot of time in this call removing those calls just gave us another 20 percent of more time to actually process packets there is still a lot more to be done but these were just like the two calls that just like shined out on the, on, 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 on the, on the profile and uh, they were really easy to fix. In BGPD, uh, one thing that's really important that we added now is 4-byte AS number support. Um, the AS number space is slowly getting um, out of numbers. I think we're now uh, seeing already uh, AS numbers in the range of 50,000 or something like that and the uh, it's until now it was just the two octet so uh, it will be out of numbers pretty soon what is the AS number? the AS, uh, AS is an uh, autonomous system the every ISP or actually everybody that wants to do default free routing needs an AS number and it's just a 16-bit value so that's actually the first thing that we're running out before we run out of IPv4 address space or everything else we run out of these 
And uh, there was now, at the beginning it was an internet draft and it's now finally an RFC um, to uh, move BGP, the protocol, to four byte AS numbers. We were probably one of the first um, projects to add it officially to our tree. There were uh, patches flowing around for Zebra and Quagga, but I think they're still not committed in their systems. Um, it is internally OSPF, uh, BGPD is now always using 4 byte AS numbers, so everything is converted to the uh, 4 octet one. Um, and the only thing well, that we don't do is we don't do the native 4 byte AS uh, sessions which uh, are only used if you actually talk to a system that actually has a 4 byte AS number. So normally it's turned off because we found out that um, quite a lot of systems are currently not able to handle this, um, this capability correctly and so you have issues to get the, the session up. Um, we added so filtering support for IPv6 and we fixed a lot of issues in the IPv6 multi-protocol handling. So it seemed that, um, yeah, not too many people are actually using IPv6 together with OpenBGPD and it changed in the last half year and that's why we actually started to find all these bugs. Um, in OSPFD we added support for uh, stop router advertisements. The, um, the main issue that the thing is track, uh, trying to attach is attack is the problem that if you start up your OSPF router and you don't have like forwarding enabled or you don't couple your uh, forwarding information base <laughs> um, with, um, with if, if the, the kernel routing table is not connect uh, doesn't get the updates from the OSPF daemon you end up in a situation that you have a OSPF daemon running in your system, in your OSPF cloud, that is unable to actually forward the traffic. And the other systems don't realize that. And normally it can happen that then you send traffic to this host that should actually pass the host to another, in, to another OSPF router. So it's, it's actually a transit point and the, the router doesn't know how to transit the traffic. And either it drops it, which is actually probably a good thing or it actually creates a loop which brings down probably your network. So what we did is we added this uh, stop router advertisement that just if, if one of these conditions is not, if, if the system is not able to actually run correctly it will only announce himself with the highest metric possible and by doing that the system is just a leave node in your OSPF graph and no traffic is actually flowing through to your systems unless it actually has to hit that router. Um, we added uh, carp demotion to OSPF. It's now possible to set it on interfaces and even on areas. On the interfaces we already track the, uh, track the interface state of the, uh, in, in OSPF. The, so we just check the interface state and if the interface goes down, we raise the uh, carp demotion counter. On the areas, it's a little bit more complex. An area is, for us is considered active as soon as we see another neighbor that is uh, able to uh, transport traffic with us. Um, the other really cool thing is now that we are able to map uh, routing labels to AS external tags. And by doing that, it's possible to distribute policies based on these routing labels to other systems. So you have a one-to-one -one mapping, and you can then um, define that, like you have your your uh, you can have like multiple ring levels or something like that, and you say, okay, this network is in ring one, this network is in ring two, this network is in ring three, and you just have on all your border routers you have your PF config that's everywhere the same thing that just checks the, uh, the, the routing labels and decides based on these routing labels if it is allowed to pass the traffic from one ring to the other. And uh, this normally simplifies it. 
uh, one thing that you normally have to use like a PF table or you have your 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 uh, somewhere you have to manage all these uh, networks in which class you actually add them and by using OSPF to redistribute this information you no longer have the ability to um, to forget to update one of your systems because they're learning it automatically. So uh, I will look a little bit uh, how to use this stuff. So CARP and OSPF, that's always a little bit a uh, tricky relationship because CARP uh, is doing on, is, is more or less doing the same thing as OSPF. They try to figure out what's the, the, the state of your link and they CARP is actually switching between machines and OSPF. Um, it's, it's just not working correctly. So what you have to, to, to do that, it's, that, that you don't end up with a, a half working setup. Um, now OSPF honors the CARP state, so if it is master or backup. If it is master, it will redistribute the network. If it is backup, it will not. Um, we now can use a demote group um, to preempt the CARP interface based on the state of a different network. So you have your outgoing interface and say, okay, um, we demote CARP based on that. Um, but now the, the, the problems. So redistribute connected does not really work with CARP. There are two scenarios. One is uh, you have a numbered parent interface and then it's so that redistribute CARP will actually monitor your parent interface and not the CARP interface so it will start to redistribute the route even so you're actually in backup state. The other thing is um, there is some strangeness in, in CARP that when it comes up it announces the, uh, the route in some strange ways, especially if you run it on, uh, if you have an unnumbered um, parent and CARP has actually to add its network to the routing table. It's, it's messing around with the routing table and it's still not 100% correct what it's doing. So um, the redistribution code normally doesn't get it when the system comes up because when, you, when it's first adding its network to the, uh, to the backup state, uh, BGP doesn't recognize it. This is actually a connected route and, and OSPF neither. And so um, we have to fix that. I think I have a fix for it, but it's, uh, it's not really, uh, yeah, it's routing table stuff. <laughs> um, so in the end, everybody should use interface carp in their config. Um, that just works. And um, so how does it work? It's normally so that you want to have your client machine in your, in your network or like to your server housing um, have a redundant uh, outgoing router. So you have your two OSPF routers at the, at the edge um, that both have a CARP interface to the inside network and uh, you use this CARP interface IP on all your servers or all your machines as default gateway. Now, um, if one machine fails, the, uh, the, the, carp I, the carp IP will, will start to flip and that's all okay. But if until now, uh, if one of the, the outgoing interfaces to the OSPF cloud failed, um, the carp interface didn't change. Now we change with the demotion counter, we can do that as well. So we demote based on the state of affix P1 and if there uh, happens, uh, if, if we lose the link there, it will actually swip, uh, switch the CARP interface and the other side will become master and start to redistribute the route. So this is about how you set it up and that's the configuration. So you have, you, you assign a router ID to your system, you have your area zero, uh, zero configuration, which the, the first four lines is for uh, your crypt authentication. We have two keys. We tell the system that it should use the key one as master key, but also accept the other one as intermediate. 
Um, we have the main link, which is the interface FXP1, where we just demote the CARP. And we announce the CARP interface with interface CARP0. That's it. That's the whole OSPF config. Um, another thing is that a lot of people probably don't realize already is multipath routing and so how does it work? Um, and is it actually the way to break your network in multiple ways? So in multipath routing you have to uh, know that the return path may not be the same as the one you're sending the, the stuff out. So you get asymmetric routing. Um, asymmetric routing is normally a problem when you have firewalls in between it, especially if you have stateful firewalls in between it, because one machine gets the incoming state and the other one gets the outcoming state, and this will not, this, this will not work. Um, one really big issue that we still have to figure out how we want to solve it is if you're actually sending out traffic from your machine, from your connected machine. So if you have a uh, uh, a TCP session going out from your system. The problem is that we do a bind and choose the uh, source IP address and then later on we do the multi-path uh, uh, multi lookup and it's possible that we actually choose one IP from one interface but actually sending it out on the other interface which normally will uh, get would, would get you in, prob uh, in troubles with anti-spoof or uh, your PF chicks. So you have to look out there. Um, the forwarded traffic itself is not affected by this. So it's only traffic that is actually coming out of your box that may uh, have this problem. One big issue is that we uh, do not realize when one of the, the multipath links is lost. So you end up with, uh, if, you have two, if you have two routes and one is no longer reachable, then you have like 50% packet loss. And it's only like half of your machines is probably affected and the other one isn't. isn't. So it's um, probably a little bit of a problem to figure out what actually is the problem. Um, at the moment, you can work it around with the EF state D and a shell script that actually monitors the next hops and then uh, removes the, the routes if necessary. As usual, uh, incoming traffic cannot be load balanced, that's like with everything. Um, you need to enable multipath um, with a sysconfig. control. You uh, need to add the minus m path switch to route when you add a second boot else the, uh, the uh, system will not like, accept it. And if you remove a multipath route, you actually have to, st uh, to specify the, uh, the next hop as well. So you have to identify the route by the prefix and by the next hop to be able to remove it. Um, now to the policy routing stuff. <coughs> this is still very, um, yeah, it's not really finished. Um, but a few information that are probably interesting is that we support multiple routing tables. At the moment we limit it to uh, 256 tables. The uh, main routing table has always the ID0. Um, PF can do the packet classification and choose the routing table based on that. What is not yet supported is um, it is it can only be used in the forwarding path, so outgoing connections always use the main table. Um, we don't have any link layer information in the uh, various alternate tables, so it is not possible to bind interfaces to uh, routing tables, or it's not possible to use the same network twice, like having it on FXP1 and FXP0, the same network, it, that doesn't work. Um, there is no fallback to the main table, so if the root lookup in, the, in, the, in, in your alternate table fails, the packet is dropped. Um, the next hop is actually looked up in the, uh, in the main table, so uh, 
you need to have all next hub in the main tables. Uh, as I already said, it's not possible to bind interfaces to specific tables. And um, yeah, multiple tables and multipath routes can be combined. That's mm, nothing really. Uh, <coughs> To add something to a routing table, you have to specify which table you want to use. You have to uh, use the minus T switch to route. You can, um, you can also show the table with the minus T switch. And with it's, it's just, you have to specify it for every action you want to use. So um, you can also use minus T0 for the main table, but it's, that's the default. Um, now, what's happening at the moment? Um, where are we going? So, one of the, the things that already hit the tree was the RTM version bump that we did. We changed the routing messages. We cleaned them up. We use everywhere now 64-bit counters. Um, we included the routing table IDs and the um, uh, routing priority to the various headers. Um, and the whole, the whole thing is more or less source compat uh, it's, it's more or less compatible with old binaries and it's completely uh, compatible with um, applications that use that include that route H and when you recompile it you just get the new, the new stuff. Um, as I said, it's already part of current. There was uh, that was quite a large change and uh, a few things broke while doing that. So, yeah, what was the problem? The problem is rtsoc.c. rtsoc.c is one of the most evil parts of the network stack I know. Um, there are a lot of bad magics going in there and a lot of dragons hide in that file. It's insane. Um, another thing that broke was OpenVPN. OpenVPN uh, did actually something very stupid. They ripped out part of netroute.h and added it to their source files directly. So they have like this if dev freebsd, we have this and this and this and this and this defined. If dev openbsd or netbsd, we have this, 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 this defined. And suddenly nothing worked anymore. Um, so, yeah. Include net route.h. Don't do silly if def games, and especially if you have the capability to run autocon for 10 minutes or something like that, you should actually do it correctly. Um, another thing that we're working on is virtual routing and forwarding. That's using the multiple routing tables. Um, we are now able to do this because we actually changed the routing messages. Um, we still need to change a few other things. We need to extend the interface or struct EFNAT to add a default routing table ID so that the incoming traffic is actually hit to the is, is actually bound to the to the correct um, virtual routing uh, instance. Um, we need to modify the ARP lookup code and the same thing in, in IPv6 and uh, to, to support the multiple routing tables so that the uh, ARP lookups are actually added to the right table and not all end up in the, in the table zero. And um, yeah, we have to support some way of cross VRF routing. At the moment, uh, I'm not yet sure if we want to just abuse PF because it's already able to select the, uh, the, the, the routing tables or if we should s implement a special loopback interface that has one end in one table and the other end in the other table. Um, another thing is routing priorities that um, is more or less done now and should probably be committed in, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, the idea behind this is to simplify the synchronization uh, of, um, of the routing daemons. Currently, the routing daemons need to keep track of what else happens on the system to understand if, if we actually have a conflict in routes and we have to decide if it's now the BGP route that we should take or the OSPF one. Um, routing priority removes that 
synchronization, uh, synchronization need. Um, we just uh, track everything in the kernel and the kernel does the decision and so in the end we, the, the user land no longer has to, to do this decision and it simplifies a lot of code. Um, we just add a new metric to every route that we add. We abuse the multipath code for that. Instead of doing equal coast multipath routing, we now have like different coast multipath routing and we just always use the one with the lowest priority uh, because lower is better. Um, and uh, when you add or delete routes, you then have to specify which one you actually want to delete. So um, the last thing here, route delete behaves strange uh, it behaves strange because of this. I fixed this on the on the train ride to Copenhagen now, so this is no longer true. Um, in the end, the basic fun functionality is now running. It's working on my laptop, um, but there is still yeah, there are still dragons. So uh, it needs a lot of testing. What will happen in OSPFDA uh, in the next couple of months? Um, we want to add equal cost multipath routing to OSPF. We have it 95% done. It's, uh, there's just a uh, last K route bit missing. Um, we want to support stop areas. We want to make use of the routing priorities when they get into the tree to simplify the code. Uh, other thing that we actually consider is the not so stubby area support. And in the end, we want to fix more bugs because there's still something, uh, there, there are still some cases where strange things happen and um, yeah, they're hard to find. Another thing that we will start, or actually was started, is uh, OSPF version 3, that's the IPv6 support for OSPF. Um, this will be a new daemon because the protocol is quite different. We're making slow progress. Um, we are now able to send out the first hello packets but a little bit more is needed. Uh, it is slow mostly because APV6 is, uh, at least I consider it painful because a lot of stuff that is really simple to do on an IPv4 address is very complex on an IPv6 address. Uh, one of the problems is like you have uh, link local addresses that you don't have in, in IPv4 that just makes everything a little bit more complex. I hope that we have at least a minimal support in OSPF, uh, in OpenBSD 4.3. In uh, BGPD, uh, we have to fix the MRT dump output. Uh, until now, nobody realized that, that since we switched to 4 byte AS numbers, the uh, output format is no longer the, yeah, correct. So we need to, to fix this. We want to use, yeah, Routing priorities again. Another thing that I want to add is uh, extended communities attributes. Then uh, one thing that could be f could be fun is the great fool restart mechanism, together with carp failover, that you can actually have a hot standby router running already with the, the whole uh, routing table ready, and when the master fails, it just brings all sessions up. It already starts routing and just. Uh, s synchronizes the tables again and uh, you actually have no, uh, you will actually no longer see even a, a slightest drop of connectivity. Um, the last one is something that uh, is also on my, on my list to do, it's the uh, BGP MPLS VPN support. Uh, that's a, an extension to the multi-protocol stuff and um, especially with the, uh, the idea that we probably get MPLS support in 4.3, uh, these things uh, actually make, uh, it's getting more and more interesting. Um, we're working on uh, MPLS by using the old Ayami uh, code base that um, was written for NetBSD it's, I think, at least three years old now. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, 
we need another, we need special routing daemons for MPLS because there is, you have to, to exchange the, the switching information, uh, we have to add a lot of stuff in the kernel and uh, one thing uh, that we're probably doing different to Ayami is that we do not uh, start to do IP input, IP output hacks to do the, uh, to do the f f uh, forwarding decisions but instead we're trying to implement a generic MPLS interface as an endpoint so that you can just normally route your traffic to the MPLS endpoint or bridge your traffic to the MPLS uh, endpoint and then it will just flow through your MPLS network and get out on the other side. Um, in my opinion that's the more logic approach to it. So yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? <laughs> yep. Could you describe more what kind of systems you use for a router? Um, we're normally using i386 or AMD 64s. Um, we add not too much RAM. We, we normally, at the moment, I think most of our systems have one gigabyte of RAM. That uh, should be enough for the next couple of years. Um, we use, normally we use uh, high-end gigabit cards, so either EM, uh, SK, or probably BGE. And uh, we have to, yeah, we do a little bit of tuning, but not that much. <coughs> so these systems are normally capable of routing quite a lot of traffic through them. It's actually, it. Um, Using SMP systems with more than two CPUs does not make sense. Two CPUs is probably okay to have like one system, uh, one CPU running the kernel stuff and having the other one running userland BGP application and stuff. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, L2TP, when is that? Uh, yeah. It's on my list. The problem is I don't have enough time. So, uh, if anybody else wants to do it, I'm happy to get this. <laughs> it's probably not that complex, but yeah, it's we tricky. We uh, add the frameworks that can be reused in some other... Yeah. Stupid to start a separate yeah, it's the, the trick is if you want to do uh, LTTP version 3 or version 2 or how you mix them together, that it's getting easier. Any other questions? Yep. MPLS is currently supported. Yeah, MPLS. We we have uh, an, a bigger diff outside of the tree, and uh, I hope that the guy that is working on it is uh, finally dis uh, reappearing again because he just disappeared over the couple uh, of, over the last couple of months, and uh, I try to push him again to to get his stuff. And I hope that we can commit it in the next couple, yeah, let's say um, in the next month or something like that, that we are already have something in tree and then can fix it in tree. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it should apply and it builds. I, I haven't seen it since a long time. I have a very early version of it and uh, a lot of other stuff is already fixed, so I want to see it again. And the problem is, People that just disappear is a, a large problem in the open source uh, community. <laughs> um, we need to stop we, we that. Yeah. Yep. We start a talk in M4 if you want on any subject. It's readily available. But Steve is about to start his talk. Yeah. Okay.